Thank you so much. I want to just uh, take a moment to acknowledge that. Uh, it's a blessing. Wow. Oh, wow. Thank you. I am really sorry. Thanks. I, I want to say uh, we just had a, a, a very important meeting with uh, Grand Chief Seti and Grand Chief Dumas and Regional, Regional Chief Woodrose. Uh, a tremendous honor. I want to acknowledge also I'm here with my colleagues, Leah Gazan and Daniel Blakey. Uh, and we wanted to just speak to you today after this meeting to again recommit that New Democrats want to be allies to bring justice for the first people of this land. After I think the conscience of Canada was shaken after the discovery of the first 215 kids in unmarked graves. And since as more and more kids are being found in these unmarked graves, it is, it is pushing us to, do, to go beyond the words that we've heard from, from leaders in the past. We need action. And, and so what we are committed to do is to fight with everything we have for justice. We spoke today about making sure every kid is brought home, that any community that needs resources and support should get that support to discover, uh, to uncover other children found in, in other potential mass grave sites. We want to make sure we're committing to clean drinking water. We want to make sure that we're fighting with everything we have to respect treaty, land, and entitlement to make sure we're tr respecting treaty rights. Chief Woodrow's mentioned 150 years of treaties and the meaning of those treaties. These are relationships between settlers, between Canada and the first people of this land. And they have to be honored. And uh, Grand Chiefs, both Grand Chiefs and, and Regional Chief mentioned how important that is. Uh, we want to be allies and we want to be standing shoulder to shoulder to walk a path of justice, of respect, of dignity. Walk that path acknowledging that we should be working with Indigenous communities as nation to nation, as partners. It should not be an Ottawa knows best approach, but one of allyship and partnership and working together. That's the path we want to walk, and we're really honored to have listened to the, the concerns in the north of clean drinking water, of children not having access to good child welfare services that are just and run by and for Indigenous people. Uh, we want to be allies, and we want to stand with you, and um, we're honored to be here to share those words with you. Uh, thank you so much, Grand Chief. Thank you so much, Grand Chief Seti, Grand Chief Dumas. And uh, again, on behalf of all new Democrats, you can count on us to fight for you. you. With that, I'll, I'll open it up if there are any questions from media. And then uh, for folks that are around, if you want to stick around, I'd love to say hi to you all. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is a beautiful place to be, and thank you so much for being here. Really honored to see you. Thank you. What a powerful question to receive standing beside uh, two powerful voices for Indigenous justice, uh, Grand Chief Seti and Grand Chief Dumas. Just for folks maybe listening, the uh, question is around Ryerson University now is officially going to change its name. And one of the reasons Ryerson, as folks might know, was one of the architects of residential institutions. So I think that's a powerful uh, announcement coming from the university that is welcomed. Uh, I think public institutions and public spaces should be named in a way that brings people together, makes people feel welcome, and to acknowledge that there are some names that should be in history books, but maybe not in public spaces, I think is a powerful announcement and appropriate. Well, one of the things that, that I've committed to doing and what I really strongly believe is that uh, I have a, a platform where as national leader, I can invite the media to come to different events and to use that platform for me has been one of my greatest honors to be able to use it to bring up issues that impact indigenous people. So we went to Kaosis First Nations and, and were there on the grounds of where 751 unmarked gra graves were found. Uh, that to me was incredibly important so that we don't forget I find sometimes with trauma, people uh, initially there was a big response, lots of outpouring of support, and then as more and more children were discovered, it seemed to be people were getting desensitized. I think there's some trauma that we can't look away from. We have to acknowledge it, we have to look at it, we have to see it, and then we have to do more for justice. And that's why that was really important and powerful. Today's meeting 
with the leadership of the indigenous communities here in Manitoba. For me, it was really important, and I want to acknowledge that it's important to our entire team, and that's why I wanted to raise awareness about issues that are impacting indigenous people, and that the federal government really is one of the key players in making sure that there is justice, and so that's why it's so important for me to be here um, and to raise these issues. Well, for me, I've always thought that uh, it's important, obviously, to mourn. It is important to acknowledge the, the pain that we feel as a country and, and lowering the flags at half mass has uh, an important message that it sends. But what's more important is that we actually walk the path of justice. The, the symbolic motions are important, but what's even more important is that we support Indigenous communities that want to discover uh, any other uh, potential mass graves, that we need to support communities that are dealing with the trauma. We've met with people that are directly impacted survivors, but also the children of survivors, and then grandchildren of survivors of residential institutions. This is intergenerational trauma, and the pain of that doesn't just go away. So what's more important than just uh, the, the sim symbolic gesture of lowering the flags is, is actually making sure we, we support communities with that trauma and in the healing. We support communities in bringing every single child back home. That's what we need to do. In general, we need to make voting as easy as possible, and, and voting is easy. And I think one of the things we need to do better is just to provide information around how to do it. I want to encourage everyone listening. Uh, if you live in a reserve, if you live in an urban setting, uh, wherever you live, please get out and vote. It is easy to do. You can do a mail-in ballot. We can look it up online. There's lots of folks that are willing to help you. You can contact your local office, but you can get your mail-in ballot. You can vote online. You can vote right now at returning offices. Uh, we want to encourage people to vote as much as possible, but we do want to acknowledge that it has been hard for communities, particularly rural and remote communities, particularly for indigenous communities, to participate. That's been very difficult. Uh, I want to encourage, as a country, we have to do everything possible to make sure it's easy and it's accessible for everyone in our country to vote. And I want to encourage everyone, please get out and vote. Use the online tools. Use the mail-in ballots. Go in person if you can. Uh, it is safe. It is secure. Please vote. step aside for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. I, I think I, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Jagmeet for meeting with us. Uh, simply simply uh, out of respect, uh, he's made himself available. Uh, can commend his colleagues as well. He'd, he'd actually dedicated a, a specific amount of time for us to to get together, uh, share some food, and uh, and have a good conversation on on these real issues that are that are impacting our community. So I think that uh, the significance of, of making that effort is, is something that uh, that everyone should observe. Um, you know, I, and I'm going to encourage uh, all the other leaders to to do something similar. Uh, and as a follow-up or supplementary to uh, uh, Jagmeet's response to the previous question, uh, we have, we had, uh, you know, Grand Chief Sati, Grand Chief Daniels, as well as Regional Chief uh, Woodhouse, we will be hosting a, a series of Facebook Live uh, uh, debates for, for our leaders on the week of the 13th to the 17th. Uh, we will be moderating those conversations, and Jagmeet has uh, committed to participating in, in, that, in that discussion where we will be directly engaging with our communities through our, our Facebook Live uh, streams that we do at the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. I think that's uh, also very significant and uh, all the other party leaders should, should take note as well. Thank you. As Indigenous leaders, we have a vested interest in what happens in the political climate in uh, Canada because ultimately it will affect our First Nation people. And it's our duty as Indigenous leaders to 
to speak to every candidate because they, we, they need to hear from us more than we need to hear from them because 150 years after this relationship with Canada, we know that there's been a breakdown in that relationship. And after 150 years, there's still treaties that have not been honored. And it's our job to make sure that our treaties are at the forefront of any of these discussions. And also that we need to get our issues on the consciousness of every Canadian because of what happened as of late, uh, the uh, discovery of these uh, unmarked graves, I think it woke us up as a nation to, to look at our history in a real way. And without no truth, there can be no reconciliation. And we want to make sure every candidate has an opportunity to hear from us as opposed to us hearing from them because our, our Indigenous people's issues matter and uh, they've never mattered more than today. It was Hania. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd, prob I'd probably say that I would, I'd endorse somebody who excels in, in an institution where uh, they're not supposed to be. You know, I have, no, I have nothing but respect for Jagmeet Singh. I think that on a personal level, he's a tremendous leader, uh, regardless of the flag that, that flies behind him. I, I, always, I always support strong leadership, sound leadership. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity is there. We do our part to try and engage our communities to make informed decisions on, on whatever political decisions they make. Fundamentally, the assembly is nonpartisan, uh, but we, we, we support all strong leaders. I'm a, I'm a former history teacher, teacher of First Nations, and I can tell you the stories of colonialism and assimilation and how each party in the past has harmed our people in some fashion or other. So I think that in my view, like being nonpartisan, we still have to be working with whoever is in government because ultimately they make decisions. And that it's up to each and every individual who they decide to vote for. But at the same time, from an indigenous lens, we have to be mindful of the history, the colonial history that has uh, plagued our nations for so long. And we want to make sure that our people are informed, that they can form, uh, vote from an informed position. And I think that ideally, uh, the way that we should be in, in, in Canada is we need to have our own voice. But until that time comes, we have to utilize these parties to move our issues forward. So, but I think that the greater uh, preference would be to have our own voice in Parliament as, opposing, uh, as opposed to using these uh, existing systems. But until that time comes, we have to work with whoever wants to work with us. That's where we are. Avez-vous réussi là-dessus? Parce que vous avez répondu qu'ils ne l'ont pas fait. 2015, Justin Trudeau a promis de s'assurer que toutes les communautés autochtones vont avoir l'eau potable. Après 600, il, elle a dit que ça va être la réalité après 600. Après 600, elle a dit qu'elle ne peut pas réaliser ses promesses. Donc, il a, il a admis effectivement qu'il a brisé sa promesse. Et ce qui est important de savoir, c'est le fait qu'on est dans le 28e, uh, 20th, uh, the 21st century, on est dans une, uh, un pays de G7, on a les ressources nécessaires pour s'assurer que toutes les communautés autochtones ont accès à l'eau potable. Il n'y a pas d'excuses pour expliquer comment ça prend 600 pour s'assurer que toutes les communautés autochtones ont, ont, ont accès à l'eau potable. En plus, maintenant, la promesse, c'est ils ont, Justin Trudeau a dit, ils ont besoin de cinq plus des ans, cinq ans de plus pour livrer ce euh, droit fondamental. J'ai parlé avec euh, le grand chef, euh, c'était de ce qui se passe dans le nord de, du Manitoba. C'est encore une situation horrible pour plusieurs communautés. Donc, euh, c'était une prise promesse. Uh, dans un pays où on a les ressources, on a les technologies, il n'y a pas d'excuse pour s'assurer que toutes les communautés autochtones 
on a accès à l'eau potable. Pour nous, euh, on a déjà montré pendant cette pandémie comment on a aidé les Québécois et Québécoises. Quand les Québécois et Québécoises ont eu besoin d'aide, on était là pour eux. Presque 1,8 million de Québécois et Québécoises ont reçu la PCU. C'était nous qui avons forcé le gouvernement libéral de la doubler. C'était nous qui avons euh, mis en œuvre un programme, un programme de congé des maladies payés pour les aider. Pour moi, je cherche des solutions. Je sais qu'on vit dans un pays fédéraliste et c'est normal qu'on travaille ensemble. On doit travailler ensemble. Mais ce qui n'est pas normal, si quelqu'un fait face à un problème, si quelqu'un a vu la perte de leur proche dans les centres de soins de longue durée, ce qui n'est pas normal, c'est de dire « Oh, ce n'est pas notre compétence, ce n'est pas notre juridiction, euh, on ne peut pas faire quelque chose ». Pour moi, ça montre un manque de leadership. Un vrai leader, c'est quelqu'un qui trouve des solutions, qui essaie de régler les problèmes, qui veut aider les gens. Et c'est exactement ce que je veux faire en travaillant avec les Québécois et Québécoises. Je veux aider les gens. Um, I'm always looking forward to the future. Thank you. Thank, good to meet you. Uh, you're somebody that I actually wanted to I'll shake your hand a little later. I think you were a, a, a leader in your own right, a trailblazer. I want to acknowledge you in that sense uh, in this moment. Uh, but I always go by the, 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 the conviction, uh, the, the acumen and the expertise of our leadership in Manitoba. I want to acknowledge all of our chiefs. I want to use the First Nations pandemic response and our mobilization as to how, how, we, how we, we, we used our leadership in, in, in this country. While I appreciate the, the, the healthy working relationship that we have had with Minister Miller and, and some of his, his counterparts, fundamentally it's First Nations leadership that guided, guided the process. It is First Nations acumen and First Nations expertise that paves the way for all of us. I want to acknowledge our leaders. When First Nations do well, we all do well. When we were able to access a vaccine for our populations and we had, and we had additional resources, we shared with our neighboring communities, with, with the rest of our neighbors in, in this province. I want to acknowledge those chiefs for doing those things as well. But fundamentally, we will work with who, who, who we want to work with, uh, who's willing, who's wanting to work with us. We want to work in a meaningful way with people, and we were more than willing to guide, guide anyone who's, who's willing to listen. Uh, unfortunately, uh, far too often, uh, people choose to talk about us and not talk with us, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a very hard lesson for some people to learn. You know, unfortunately, I believe uh, the Premier of Manitoba feels the ramifications of that to this day. Um, uh, I, I want to acknowledge, you know, our, our health team experts and how they dealt with the pandemic, our, our allies within the provincial healthcare system who were, who were willing to listen and take direction from First Nations expertise and acumen. And I know that Jagmeet is, is more than willing to listen. Uh, I want to acknowledge his, his colleagues who are here who have taken every opportunity uh, in, in their own way to take proactive steps to, to try and be, uh, stand in solidarity with the different advocacy that we've done at the assembly. So the opportunity is, is, is on uh, uh, Jagmeet and his, and his colleagues to, to, to learn from First Nations so that we could be that guiding hand, hand that will create a, a better future for us all if everybody's willing to work with us. Igose. Uh, Creason, good to meet you. It's an honor. Uh, historically, uh, non-Indigenous uh, entities have tried always to fix the conditions of our people and bringing their solutions. 
bringing their agenda, but I think that this time the agenda has been turned. When we come to the government and say, uh, everything you've done in the past to try to fix our problems has created a bigger mess. So we come to you with solutions. We come to you with a plan. And do you want to implement this plan or do you just want to put it on a shelf? That is the question that we're asking every uh, candidate at this juncture because I believe for far too long, the people have in, sat in offices trying to figure out what is best for First Nations and they've never stepped foot on a reserve in their life. So that's gonna change and it's changing right now because our people need to be listened to. Our people need to be heard and that's what we're doing. We're going across the spectrum to make sure that our indigenous people have their issues heard and also have a plan to implement those, uh, those uh, recommendations by our people. And also uh, truth and reconciliation calls to action and uh, also the plan of actions that are, are still not implemented, that has to change. And treaties have to be implemented. The whole reason why our First Nations are in the mess is because the lack of the implement implementation of treaties. If we want to fix First Nations, implement the treaties. Case closed. Egozani. I really appreciate the question, the questions around mental health. Uh, in this pandemic, what we've seen is our existing problems in our health care or a lack of funding, a lot of the existing problems in our long-term care, a lot of those existing problems were laid bare by the pandemic. And what we've seen particularly when it comes to mental health is that the isolation and the other important measures that we had to take to keep people safe have really borne a toll on, on people's mental health, particularly young people. And we're hearing a lot of young people that have been, been hurt and, and, are, and are suffering right now with mental health. And there's still a lot of stigma around, around getting access to mental health. And on top of that, mental health is not being treated as a part of our healthcare system. It's treated as almost like a luxury that if you can afford to get access to care, then you can get it, but for a lot of people, they can't. So what we're committing to for the people of Manitoba and for all Canadians, we want to see our healthcare system include mental health. Mental health should be a fundamental part of our healthcare system so that anyone can access it. It shouldn't depend on how much money you earn or what's in your bank account. Everyone should have, have access to mental health, and that's one of our commitments. Thanks so much. I think that we have to move beyond rhetoric and we have to see concrete plans of actions to implement all the things that our people have been addressing for the last 150 years. So it's time to get real. And pardon the expression, it's time for the BS to stop. And let's get real with First Nations here in Canada. They have suffered too long. They didn't ask to be in this condition. We never asked to be in these conditions but we signed treaties with the Crown, and for 150 years we have very, seen very little implementation of those treaties, and our people rightly deserve their part of these agreements, and it has not happened. So I think that it's time for rhetoric to stop, and it's time for action. Words, you know, are something that are spewed out so frivolously, but action 
is what we want. Yeah. Um, I, just, I just want to sort of restate some of my comments, and I want to acknowledge the leadership in Manitoba. Uh, uh, we've always led the way with, with different initiatives, and I, I want to acknowledge our chiefs who, who, who helped flatten the curve in this province so that we could all become better protected and look out for one another. Uh, with that said, we need, we need a government that is, is willing to listen, a government that's not going to uh, impose half measures or half steps in, in dealing with things, a government that's going to actually listen to the direction a government that's not going to come with prescribed concepts and prescribed notions, who's actually willing to listen to the results that have actually been developed in this province from our leadership through our expertise and acumen for decades. We actually have all the solutions here in Manitoba. Uh, it's just that we have to have people who are willing to listen and willing to be courageous enough to take that step and, and move with us and, and allow them to be guided uh, by First Nations uh, like they were at the beginning of our of our relatives getting together, uh, it needs to happen. That needs to happen again today. Um, take for example the national hall, the recent national holiday in, in acknowledgement of, of of residential school. Um, I believe that uh, I want to challenge the government and and everyone to sort of have a conversation about that. Why is it not an actual stat holiday? Why is it actually not something tangible that everybody sort of has to adhere to? I think that would be a a considerable and significant. Uh, um, decision that would, would actually show a meaningful process towards reconciliation and an acknowledgement of, of, of not only residential school survivors but all of these children who are speaking loudly and clearly that were found in these unmarked mass graves that were murdered in these institutions of genocide. Thanks. No. <laughs> no, uh, our executive has uh, recognized the candidate that is running for a writing, and she's Indigenous. And then we want Indigenous people to get involved in uh, this uh, process because, as I said earlier, we have a vested interest in what happens uh, in, in Canada when it comes to our Indigenous people. And uh, we continue to support Indigenous people as they run. And our people are nonpartisan, as you said, and that. Uh, but of course, we will support our indigenous people wherever they are. Uh, I also like to, to support that comment. We uh, uh, and to all of our allies and everybody watching, we we always have to support uh, our First Nations candidates in the spirit of Elijah Harper. Keep in mind that Elijah Harper was flying a a, a, a specific color, who the majority of the party had made a decision without the involvement and participation of First Nations and Elijah chose not to toe the party line and Elijah actually preserved and protected this country and this constitution on behalf of all of us together and we can all celebrate in that today. So in the spirit of Elijah Harper, we will always advance our First Nations candidates uh, on that level being a uh, uh, elected official for the past two decades. Uh, I think that it's time for a fresh start in the North, and I absolutely support uh, Shirley Robinson in her candidacy. Thank you. I concur with that comment. Uh, we fundamentally and absolutely believe that that uh, that indigenous communities should be caring for indigenous children. Uh, we made that commitment today when speaking with uh, the Grand Chiefs and and Regional Chief. That's something that should happen and must happen. And we're we're committed to listen to what indigenous community leaders and indigenous communities are saying around how we can make that happen. But we are committed to it. Uh, we've been fighting for that. Uh, Leah has been a big proponent of it as well. And uh, you can count on us to continue to work with indigenous communities to make sure fundamentally indigenous-led 
uh, and Indigenous provided care uh, has to be properly funded as well. It can't just be that the responsibility falls on Indigenous communities, it also should be properly funded. I, I would have to say I think the, the NDP has led the way, certainly uh, bringing light uh, the injustice, 10 non-compliance orders, uh, to immediately stop racially discriminating against First Nations children on reserve, the 10 non-compliance orders with the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling. Bill 92 that passed in the last parliament was a good step, but it's one thing to give jurisdiction, but systems also need proper funding. What we know through the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling is that this current government willfully and intentionally, and these are not my words, racially continues to racially discriminate against First Nations children and the NDP has not let that go in the House of Commons and I feel confident under the leadership of Jagmeet Singh and our colleagues that we will continue to push and advance those issues until we really see, see, see the justice that all kids deserve in this country. Uh, that's a very good question, and I guess on, on behalf of the Assembly, we are still committed to bringing our children home. We are committed to our, the legislative um, exercise and the development of our own uh, legislation that we continue to work on. We do realize that the existing legislation is something that uh, is, is something we will have to work off of, but uh, we will continue to challenge our governments to, to actually develop uh, Manitoba-specific legislation that, that will be uh, more conducive to protecting families and, and bringing all of our children home. Thank you. Prior to European contact, we had our own systems that were able to uh, allow us to function in the capacity we took care of the children. In our culture, there was no such thing as foster care. There was no such thing as uh, apprehension because that did not exist. And in, uh, through Bill C-92, we are able to reinstate our laws, our family laws, back into the system, so, something that has not happened since uh, Canada became a state. So I think that it's important to, to realize that our, our children belong within their own culture, with their own people, with their languages, and also their, uh, their families, because that is the way we are, and that has been taken away from us. But now, We've come to a place that we're reinstating our governance systems and reinstating our family laws. And I think this is a tool and a mechanism to bring our people, and especially our children, to where they need to be. They do not have to be removed from their communities anymore. That is wrong. It has always been wrong, and it should never have happened. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that, that concludes the, the, I think the questions. And thank you so much for being here, everybody. We'd lo love to see you all. Uh, I'll try to walk around and say hi if I can. Uh, but thank you so much, everybody. Thanks so much. Merci. Miigwech. Uh, if I may, I wanted to call. I know that we have some of our youth from SCO. If you guys could come down, I, I wanted to ask uh, if you could take a photo with uh, Jagmeet. I saw a couple of you, if that's all right. And then 